often to be had. So let's welcome uh, Vikram Khan. Uh, uh, thank you. Dysfunctions in my introduction, and uh, as an indication of how significant and important Juan is, he arranged for me to have a very short commute this afternoon to come over here, uh, all of five minutes. Um, so, um, what I'm going to be talking about today basically is a topic actually that's of significant uh, importance for anyone doing any kind of social justice or economic or frankly any other kind of work related to India. And the reason for that is, as we'll discover, most of these kinds of law changes or administrative policy changes in India end up trying to be enforced through the courts. And I stress the word trying to be enforced because it's not always clear that they will get enforced. So the topic for what I'm going to be speaking about today is largely about how do you try to get things done in a legal way in India and how people in India are trying to change how things do or don't get done when you're looking at the judicial system. Now, I thought I'd begin with a little bit of an overview of what I'll be speaking about today. And can we lower the lights just a little? Ah, thank you. I always love the movie atmosphere. Okay, so let's see if we can make this a little bit more exciting than Juan suggested it might be. All right. Okay. So we'll begin with an overview here. Um, and I'll forget the microphone. I kind of like going a little bit without it. All right. So the very first thing to sort of keep in mind is... Why is the judiciary important? Why do we think so much about it? Why do we spend so much time worrying about what's going on in the Indian judiciary? And basically the concerns here are that whatever rights you get under law, whether they're law rights to protect you against caste discrimination, gender discrimination, whether they're contract rights, property rights, whatever, they all go through the legal system. And as a result, the ability to enforce those rights and to make them real all depends on your ability to get things done through the judiciary. It turns out also that economic development and general rule of law concerns are going to be important as well, and I'll focus on those in a little bit more detail in just a moment. But what is India's judicial system like at present, given that the judiciary is supposed to be so important? Well, um, if you talk to most people in India, they affectionately describe it as somewhere between dysfunctional and borderline non-effective. Uh, why is that? <laughs> Largely speaking, because there are many delays in the judicial system, extremely low conviction rates for crimes, perceptions of widespread to moderate corruption, and limited access to people who don't have access to, for example, economic wealth to bring suits, or the patients to sit through and wait for them to actually come to a conclusion. We're going to talk a little bit also about what is the impact of these kinds of delays and low conviction rates and so forth on litigation in India, that is the ability to enforce rights, and also the behavior of the litigants. What we'll find basically is it gives rise to a great deal of frivolous litigation and weakened deterrence of law, thereby sort of undermining the laws that they're trying to enforce. We'll also talk a little bit about how access to justice in India gets weakened by these kinds of delays and impediments in enforcing one's rights and obligations. And then hopefully we'll try to end with a little bit more optimistic view of the world, which is this, uh, the concerns with the Indian judiciary have not evaded uh, reformers in India. They've been considering many reforms actually for decades to try to enhance the speed of the Indian judiciary. Uh, whenever they start off by saying, we've been trying to think of ways to speed up the judiciary for decades, I can't help but smile at the irony in that statement. You've been waiting for decades to speed up the judiciary. Okay. Um, in any case, we'll talk about the current set of reforms that are being proposed. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, the Indian government has actually put forward a series of reform proposals just in the last six months uh, and made it almost, I'd say, one of its top three priorities. And maybe we can talk a little bit about politically why that was important to do in India. It turns out, however, that most of the reforms that they're suggesting, um, I will argue, basically have a transitory effect, maybe benefiting the speed of the judicial system for three or four years, and are unlikely to really be long-term solutions. Then I'll end with a series of reforms that I think are probably likely to have better long-term effects and actually be able to reduce many of the delays in the judicial system. Okay, so let's start with the very basics. Why do we care about the Indian judiciary? So the very first thing, of course, as I mentioned already, is all the rights you get under the Indian Constitution, under any legislation, under any administrative ordinance, usually have to be enforced through the courts. So this creates a, something of a bottleneck effect, that is, for anything to really be happening at a legal level, you're going to have to go through the judiciary. Uh, and that means that all of the legal rights you want to enact are probably going to be sort of enacted with some sense as to the ability to enforce them through the Indian court system. 
As a result of that, it becomes critical to appreciate how the Indian system works, dysfunctions, and might be made better. All right. Second thing, economic development. For there to be economic development, most theorists will tell you, and even practice tells you, that you need to have the ability to enforce contract rights when you sign a contract with someone to provide a service, if they don't pay up, you should be able to actually find some way to get your payment. You need to be able to protect property rights because if your property rights are not protected, your incentive to acquire property diminishes. Property being a major source of wealth and economic development, your incentive to develop that becomes much less. One need only go to certain parts of India where property rights are not clear, for lack of a better word. Uh, to see that development in those areas tends to be pretty lackluster. All right. There are other things, of course, related to economic development, too. But in particular, the ability to enforce contract rights and protect property through the court system is critical to the growth of economic development, and hence the judiciary is relevant for that purpose as well. A rule of law. This is sort of maybe the most obvious, right, in some respects, which is if you don't have respect for legal institutions and judges and judiciaries don't work terribly well, you tend to undermine your ability to have a civil society. Higher property diminishes. The ability to provide the background for the kinds of institutions you would like to develop uh, in a civil society, whether those are political institutions, social institutions, or any other kind of institution that requires some basic stability and respect for rule of law to develop. OK. Um, before talking a little bit about what the Indian judicial system looks like now, I thought it would be helpful to provide you with an overview of what the judicial structure currently is. So in India, the highest court in the land is the Supreme Court of India, located, of course, in Delhi. Uh, there are uh, officially 30 judges on the 30 justices on the Indian Supreme Court, but uh, in reality, they're usually only 23 or 24. Uh, why is that? It's not because they can't find judges who would be keen to be on the Supreme Court. Apparently, they can't organize themselves fast enough to appoint people be Supreme Court judges before they're forced to retire at 65. <laughs> that seems <laughs> remarkable, right? Um, that is, after all, usually someone becomes a judge at some level in their 40s, maybe their 50s. How long can it really take you to put them on the Supreme Court? Well, sometimes over 20 years, apparently. Um, in fact, if you read the Times of India and other newspapers, you'll find ongoing debates about specific justices that are trying to get nominated to the Supreme Court and have problems with it. Below the Supreme Court, you have what are the next sort of level of courts, the high courts in India. There are 21 of those, ranging all over the country, Delhi, Mumbai, Allahabad, wherever you'd like to go, you can probably find a high court not more than about six hours away. Um, that's meant to be a little bit ironic. <laughs> okay. And then below the high courts, you have many district and magistrate level courts. And there's a distinction between district and magistrate. Magistrates are usually people who are not actually qualified attorneys could have some legal training, but they're designed basically to address what are considered less serious matters, uh, which strangely include a lot of criminal cases. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll ignore that strange sort of dissonance for the moment as well. Um, this is the official court structure, but it's important to recognize that there's actually a lot of alternative justice delivery mechanisms within India. And the logic behind the vast majority of these is that uh, people who are not economically, uh, who are economically challenged or poor, may not be able to access these levels. So we give them sort of simpler, more homegrown ways of dispensing justice. Uh, and they go under a variety of names. Panchayat Raj, Lok Adalas, DRT refers to debt recovery tribunals, Nyay Panchayat, Gram Nyalas, CLB is a company law board, SAT is securities appellate tribunal, BFIR is the Board of Industrial and Financial Reconstruction, translation dysfunctional, uh, mediation, family law courts, and so forth. Why do I say dysfunctional for the Board of Industrial Financial uh, of uh, industrial financial reconstruction. That's India's bankruptcy courts. Uh, they can take up to 25 years to close a company that's already failed. It's hard to know why you would need that long to do it, but apparently that's what they are. As I said, the vast majority of these are designed to bring sort of simple homespun justice to the masses in the villages and in other parts of India. A couple of these are designed to target commercial cases to try to speed them up. That would be the company law tribunal and the SAT, and in theory the BFIR, but it doesn't quite work that way. The reason to sort of put these out is that the reason why these mechanisms exist is a perception that the Indian judicial system is not functioning properly. These various mechanisms have been tried over a 50-year window in India. 
So the problems associated with the Indian judiciary, which I'm just about to speak to you about, have been known actually for quite some time. This is not a revelation to anybody. Uh, and they've tried alternative ways to address it in their minds. Almost all of them have failed. And we'll talk a little bit about why in just a moment. OK. So having said that, what is India's judicial system at present? OK. Probably the thing most people understand about the Indian judicial system is delay, 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 and more delay. Why is that? Well, there are over 30 million cases pending in India, and there are 12,000 courts. Uh, that means, on average, 2,500 cases per court. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with legal systems in other parts of the world, to give you a rough estimate, the US has about 400 cases per court per year. So India's judicial load is about five to six times greater than what you would see in the United States per court. That has a way of inducing delays. Uh, to add a little bit more uh, fire to this, uh, the Supreme Court in India, the highest court, has 50,000 cases pending a year. Any idea how many cases are pending in the US Supreme Court in a given year? Even less. Even less. The US Supreme Court decides usually less than 100 cases a year. India is trying to decide 50,000. Granted, they have a few more judges. The US Supreme Court has nine, India has 23, but <laughs> that doesn't really quite counterbalance that, as you might imagine. Uh, the high courts in India have 3.7 million cases. There are 21 high courts. That gives you a rough sense as to how many cases they must be holding. That's roughly 4 million cases for 20 courts. It's an incredible number if you think about it. And then the lower courts in India have 26 million cases pending in any given year. Unsurprisingly, this leads to the delays. Well, what are the delays like? Over 25% of cases in India take at least 10 years to get resolved. And in some regions, such as Mumbai, and why do I pick Mumbai? Because it's the commercial hub of India, right? Many cases, and some estimates say more than 40%, can take 10 years for the lowest level court to issue a decision, which means then you get the joy of appealing to the high court and then maybe even the joy of appealing to the Indian Supreme Court. And for those who are unfamiliar with how sometimes legal decisions get made, sometimes the Supreme Court of India will make a ruling and then say, OK, go back to the lowest court and have them determine whether the facts fit our new legal standard. So you could be doing this for quite some time. It's kind of the bottom line here. One of the uh, common things one observes when you go to India is what they call frequent adjournments. Uh, that's where an attorney will request property through the court system, the date for a hearing for two to three months or whatever. Uh, this happens usually because um, in India, the practicing attorneys, those who litigate in court, have um, hopelessly more cases than they could possibly do in a single day. Some of the best known attorneys in India will carry 30 cases a day. Uh, as a comparison, in the US, you'd be lucky to do more than two or three. Uh, so they can't possibly do all those cases. They can't possibly be informed about all those cases. So what they do is they attend usually eight or nine of them, and they send their juniors, that is their minions, to go out and basically tell the judge that our boss is preoccupied. Would you give us a little more time? It's like I mean, two or three months, and the judge is usually more than delighted to give it to you because he's got 400 cases to look at a day, and he'd be more than happy to get rid of one of them and kick it back, hope that it will settle, or something will happen to the parties, and he won't have to look at it. Um, so this is a frequent problem, because the more adjournments you get, then more and more cases are sort of pending each single day, because they're all getting delayed from prior days. OK, well, what are the cases like? Unlike most other countries, the vast majority of cases in India are criminal. 66% of the cases are criminal. It means about 2 thirds. Conviction rates are really low, about 40% of the criminal cases actually lead to convictions on average. And there's some areas of crime that have a 5 to 10% conviction rate. OK, now as a comparative metric, in the US, the conviction rate is about 90%. In Japan, it's 99.8%. In most parts of what might be called the developed world, uh, you would probably see conviction rates in the range of 85% to higher. Even in emerging markets, you see higher conviction rates, although people are worried about how those convictions are obtained, usually. But in India, that doesn't appear to be as big of a concern because conviction rates are so low, uh, only about 40% on average. The other thing that's odd about this is the fact that in most countries, the bulk of cases are civil cases, not criminal. Why is that? 
normally the logic is that people go to court to have, mad, have their rights sort of laid out and explained and applied. Those are usually civil. Uh, in India, you see actually a dearth of civil litigation. And one of the things we're going to discover is that the delays in India are not the result of over-litigatious people. It is the result of many other things, but not that. India's per capita rate of litigation is one of the lowest in the world. Suggesting that it's not that somehow the Indian people love being in court, uh, although maybe some do, but it's not any more likely than any other place. That's not really what's driving the delays. Okay, the thing from sort of a social justice perspective that's probably the most worrying about this is the under trials, I'll explain what that means in just a moment, represent the bulk of people in prison. What does that mean? When you go up for a criminal trial, uh, the usual concern is that the accused criminal will probably not want to be present because if he's found guilty, he'll go to jail. So you're worried about them absconding. So what the courts usually do is they hold you in prison until your trial occurs. This is fine if your trial's going to occur in a few days. But if it takes years for the matter to get adjudicated, then you could be sitting in prison for years. The people who are sitting in prison waiting to have their case adjudicated are called the under trials. Okay, in India, that represents approximately 200,000 people. The number of people in Indian jails is about 380,000. So a little over half the people are people who haven't actually been convicted of anything. They're just sitting there in trial because they cannot afford to pay bail. And in fact, there was a big debate going on pretty much over the last three weeks that the uh, Supreme Court of India was trying to encourage the lower courts to just let those people go. Because a large number of these under trials are being charged with offenses that have jail times that are actually shorter than they've been sitting in trial waiting, oh, which seems awful. really quite perverse. Okay. Uh, and then finally, the other thing that was a little bit surprising to me as we looked at the, at the cases is in the 33% of cases that are civil, the majority of those are actually involving the government. That is not private parties, which is strange because usually civil cases are, for example, contract enforcement disputes between two parties who have agreed to buy or sell something to each other. So what we're seeing here is, in effect, the government is the majority litigant in civil cases, and all criminal cases, of course, are initiated by the government. So my guess is, of the 30 million cases pending, you can estimate probably about 25 million involve the government in one form or the other. Okay. <laughs> this just makes it a bit worse. The perception that there's widespread, uh, the widespread perception that there's some degree of corruption going on in the Indian judicial system tends to make this worse. Of course, the fact that the government is a primary litigant and the judges are adjudicating government, that's just one arm of the government adjudicating the other one, that is a situation that will tend to lead to more corruption, especially because they can trade off political favors. One of the reasons it's so hard to appoint judges to the Indian Supreme Court is because there are a variety of judges who run into this problem. They either A, have engaged in corruption and people know about it, or B, they haven't engaged in corruption and people know about it. <laughs> that sounds perverse on both ways. But okay. <coughs> All right, and of course, these kinds of delays mean that for the average man or the average woman, going to court seems kind of pointless, right? What is the point of trying to enforce your rights against you know, being beaten or being discriminated against if it's going to take you 25 years to get a matter adjudicated? And it's going to cost you an incredible amount in legal fees to do it. As a result, a lot of people simply avoid the courts, right? That essentially means you're denying access to justice to a large number of people by inducing the delays. Most people, when they think about delays, think that that individual case leads to justice delayed as justice denied, which it may be. But what about all the people who just say, oh, it's just not worth going to court. Why would I want to go there, get dragged through the courts, where God knows what the infrastructure is like, sit there in a hot auditorium or the hot courtroom for like 20 minutes just to be told, come back in three months. And go back and forth like this for the rest of the next 25 years. Pointless. By the way, if you bring a case and you don't show up, and you don't have an excuse, they will adjourn your case to the next three months. So that you always show up and the other side doesn't. And they make up lame excuses, usually like I have an upset stomach, I tripped over something this morning, the litigant isn't here, oftentimes they're sitting in the court but the judge doesn't know. So the attorney says, my client isn't here. And you are sitting right behind him. Okay. 
Oops, sorry. All right, so looking at this, one kind of have this vision of this, um, what you might call a uh, picture of the horribles, right? You know, all these miserable things are going on in the Indian, Indian judicial system. To be clear, however, I thought it's worthwhile mentioning that a lot of what you see going on in the Indian judicial system, there's actually quite a lot of regional variation within India. Each state is a little bit different, although you can group them into various kinds of categories. So if you look at the initiation of civil cases, there are some states that are about near the national average. I've abbreviated some states here just to save space. So Maharashtra, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttarakhand, those are all near basically the national average for instituting civil cases. Uh, those that are below the national average, Uttar Pradesh, I know that surprises a lot of people. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, Chhattisgarh, Assam, Nagaland, Meghalaya, Manipur, Tripura, Mizoram, Arunachal Pradesh, Jharkhand, Orissa, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. This is basically pretty much the entire northeast and eastern chunk of India, for those of you looking at the map. Uh, and then above the national average, Goa, Delhi, Himachal Pradesh, Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Punjab, Haryana, Chandigarh. This is basically the south, the west, and the north. Okay, in terms of criminal cases, Near the national average, you can sort of see UP, Maharashtra, etc. Below the national average, Odisha, Bihar, Jharkhand, etc. Above the national average, Delhi, Gujarat, Tripura, Himachal. What does one make of this, right? There seems to be an incredible amount of regional variation. What you tend to see is that there's some places they basically don't use the courts much at all, right? In particular, what you're seeing here is Odisha, Bihar, those areas you don't tend to see people using a lot of the courts. Why is that? Because that's where you see a lot of delays. People don't really see the point of bringing suit. In fact, these also happen to be the places where you see the strongest Naxalite movements. For those of you familiar with the concept of the Naxalite, fine. If not, they're basically um, communist guerrillas, I guess, or something like that, from a city called Naxalberry. That's why they're called Naxalites. Um, why is that important? Because what they offer to the population essentially is an alternative way to govern what's going on there. Their sort of organized alternative structure is essentially a judicial contract enforcement mechanism in these states. All right, now one of the things that's always puzzling to a lot of people is why the states that have the highest economic growth seem to be using the courts the most. And the reason is because the courts function relatively better there. So people find it useful or worthwhile to actually bother to go to court in Delhi and in Goa and in Gujarat and so forth. Well, I think people might go to Goa just because it's nice, but you know, there could be other explanations. But most likely, I think what you see is a trend towards using cases, uh, to using the courts where you think the courts actually function relatively quickly. That's right. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll ignore that. Okay, so the bird's eye view here is that there are regional trends, but they're not necessarily going to be consistent across criminal and civil cases. All right. So with that picture in mind, what does this lead to in terms of the impact on litigation and the impact on the behavior of people involved in litigation and generally in India? Now here's where actually I think things get really unpleasant. Think about civil cases for a moment, right? Let's assume from the very beginning that you have a meritorious suit. That means there's actually some merit in your complaint. Delays in the judicial system essentially reduce the real value of your litigation. Why is that? Because money has time value, and the longer out in the future you need to wait for that money to come in, the less valuable that money becomes to you. As a result, more delays re reduce the value of meritorious suits. You should begin to see meritorious suits beginning to drop off the map. That is, people simply not bothering to bring them, because after a certain point in time, the recovery you get in money is not going to be worth your upfront payment and legal fees. But what about frivolous suits? Ooh, it turns out delay works the opposite direction there. <coughs> right? The value of a frivolous suit increases the longer the delay involved in adjudicating it as being frivolous, assuming the courts are actually accurate. Right? And why is that? To think of it sort of conceptually, well, if frivolous suits are basically nuisance value suits designed to extort money from you, well, the nuisance value increases with however long you have to uh, put up with this. So, the longer the litigation, the more likely it is you're going to see frivolous suits. So what you'd anticipate then as a result is, in civil cases, that the most meritorious suits will find it not worthwhile to go to court, and the least meritorious suits will actually think it's a great idea to go to court. In sort of the eco-speak here, this would be a very, very bad substitution effect. 
you're substituting bad cases for good ones. Okay? And indeed, those frivolous suits have every reason themselves to want to continue delaying the process, because that's how they're going to maximize value. That's not good for the civil system. In fact, when you talk to business people in India, they usually tell you, we don't want to litigate matters in civil disputes in Indian courts. Can we do arbitration? Can we do it in London? Which sounds a little flaky, but let's fly to London to adjudicate our business dispute in India. Apparently, that's worth it for a large number of people. The London Court of International Arbitration gets its second largest amount of business from India. Okay. Um, also, they do other things, such as um, investing in your other firms to make sure that if you exploit them in one firm, they'll exploit you in the other, which is really essentially giving and taking hostages more or less. All right, what about criminal cases? Well, delays basically tend to reduce the likelihood of conviction. Witnesses tend to forget what happened five years ago. Right? I mean, can you just imagine the defense attorney getting up in front of the court and saying, so, Mr. So-and-so, uh, you remember with precision what happened nine years ago. Right? Can you tell me what you had for breakfast a week ago? I'm pretty sure most people wouldn't remember. <laughs> right? So as a result, you can kind of imagine witnesses forgetting what they saw or heard. Evidence is likely to get contaminated. Right? Just imagine a blood sample sitting somewhere in the Delhi sun for nine years. It might not be read by the time you get, you get to it. Right? I mean, anything could happen. Anyway, what this normally does in most functional court systems is it leads to fewer prosecutions because prosecutors think, what is the point of bringing a case which we're likely to lose, right? Because the delays are going to take so long, we're probably going to get witnesses and remember anything. In India, it actually induces more prosecutions, right? Now, you might think, that seems perverse. Well, the reason is simple. Police and prosecutors are not actually evaluated on whether they obtain convictions in India. In fact, it's not entirely clear what they're evaluated on, to be honest, but it's quite clear that this is not it. Because if it was, they'd all be out of jobs, right? There's no obvious reason why you would expect this to be the case. Indeed, as we'll discover in just a moment, low conviction rates actually result in much greater rates of corruption. And that possibly explains why you see people bringing so many of these suits. So what we should expect to see are more frivolous and extortionary suits. By all accounts, this is exactly what's going on in the Indian judicial system, right? This leads to basically under deterrence of undesirable behavior. Because keep something in mind, the point of prohibiting something by law is to make less of it happen. Right? But if what's happening is meritorious suits are not being brought and frivolous suits are being brought, then the people who engage in bad behavior don't really anticipate suffering any penalty for it. That should lead to more bad behavior, which we would just call under deterrence. Right? The more bad behavior that occurs, the more likely it is that more litigation might be ensued. The more litigation that is ensued, the more delays you get, you get this sort of cycle that goes a little bit crazy at some point. All right. The under the deterrence is likely to lead to more wrongdoing, exactly the opposite of what the judicial system is designed to do. All right. Now, as I mentioned before, this is going to lead to a denial of access to justice, and of course, under trial in jail for nearly as long as a crime would permit in terms of putting someone in jail for. OK. So what can we do about this? What are the causes of these problems? So on this slide, I'm going to talk basically about the causes and what the, likely ref well, what the current reform proposals are before the Indian uh, legislature. My sense is, having looked at this area for a while now, is that one of the key indicators of why you have these kinds of delays is called over-criminalization of behavior. They criminalize everything. Right? Every trivial little thing is criminalized. Buying agricultural land is a crime. Why is that a crime? Who knows? Right? There's no actual explanation for it. They just criminalize it. Right? And as a political matter, it's easy for politicians to criminalize behavior because what's the cost? Right? Potential criminals don't make a terribly attractive lobby group as a general matter. Right? It's very easy to overcriminalize and hope that, well, since conviction rates are low, no one's really going to care. But that just worsens the problem of the gap between the number of people you arrest and the number of people you actually convict. There's way too much government litigation. right? About 80% of cases are government driven. Why is the government involved in so much litigation? What is it hoping to achieve? If you actually look at government documents, there's no conceivable consistent story for why they're involved in this much litigation. The main stories usually given are that the government doesn't want to fulfill or doesn't believe that certain uh, obligations imposed upon it under law need to be provided to the individuals they're suing. 
essentially that's the government suing so that it doesn't provide services it's required to provide under law. As far as I can tell, it doesn't get any more dysfunctional than that. <laughs> wow. Um, adjournments are a big problem. We'll talk about the incentive of attorneys as well. In India, attorneys are not paid by the hour generally, as they are in the U.S. In the U.S., we all moan about the fact that, oh my God, the guy took $300 to tell me that. Well, in India, they don't even bother with that. They charge by appearance. And I've always thought, what does that mean? If you see them, that you, they charge you? Like, if you see them fleeting by, you can take, you know, they take 500 bucks from you or something. No, what it means is every time they show up in court on behalf of your case, or anyone in their office shows up, they charge you. Precisely the reason why attorneys like to take lots of cases and then get adjournments, because every single adjournment is counted as an appearance, even if the lead attorney isn't there. If he sends a junior there to ask for a delay, that's still counted as an appearance. So for them, this is, the ability to adjourn and get delays is a perfectly good way to make money. All right, and then of course, there are too few judges. India's judge to person ratio is about 12 times worse than that of the United States. So clearly you need more judges. All right, so what are some of the reform proposals that are currently before the Indian legislature? Well, I divide them into two. One is within the judicial system, right? First one was they want to increase the number of courts and judges, right? They see a delay and they say, what's the best way to get rid of cases? Have judges adjudicate them. Seems like a sensible solution, right? How many judges do they need? They need to increase the size of the Indian judiciary by only 400% and create 100,000 more judges. Now, having attended meetings where they discuss this in the government, there's an element of sort of um, utopian insanity that seems to creep in. Why is that? Where are you going to find 100,000 more judges? Right? And their usual response is, we'll find retired judges. Retired judges are busy doing other things. That's why they retired. Right? They clearly didn't want to necessarily stay that much longer in the courts. They're usually out doing arbitrations and other things, writing books, whatever it may be. To develop 100,000 more judges in India, you're going to need to train people to be lawyers and judges. There are not enough law schools in India right now to deal with the demand for corporate attorneys where are they going to find law schools to train people to be 100,000 new judges in anything less than 25 years? Because, of course, you don't appoint a 25-year-old to be a judge, usually. As much as I thought of my abilities at the age of 25, <laughs> I might be kind of going a little too far to think that I would really make it to a judge at that age. Okay, the other reform proposal, which is completely consistent with what India perceives its commercial strength to be, is improve information technology. Why is that? It turns out that judges, there's no tracking of cases in India. What does that mean? That means that a judge could wake up in the morning, go to court and say, here are 400 cases you need to adjudicate today. He doesn't know which one of those cases is still live. Some could have settled, many do, right? He doesn't actually know if they've settled. So he sits there and wastes somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes calling out the names. Kanna. And, uh, it, it reminds me so much of essentially watching Ferris Bueller's Day Off again, right? It's like, Kanna, Kanna, where are you? And then they say, okay, he's not there, adjourn. So then three months later, they go through the same insanity again. So the idea is, okay, let's have a little bit of information technology in place so that the judges know what's going on. So now in the Delhi High Court, the judges have laptops. Great idea. I like laptops. I have a laptop. Except for the fact that there's no database that keeps track of cases. So now they've hired a bunch of uh, essentially uh, outsourced guys, the guys you call from the call centers and things, to type in the cases, which is great, except for the fact that they frequently misspell the names, which means that the courts have the wrong names for the parties. I mean, this sounds really kind of basic and pedantic, but the truth is, if you're going to try to speed up the system, you can't be having these kind of mishaps. People don't know what's going on, basically. That's not good. Okay. Proposal number two is outside the judicial system, right? If you can't fix the judicial system, try something different than it, right? So what they try to do is increase non-court dispute resolution forms. We already have 13 different kinds of non-court-based dispute resolution forms in India, the local ballots, etc. What has been the response to the most recent concerns about delays in Indian judicial system? Made a 14th one. Now, last time I checked, the definition of addiction 
is doing the same thing over and over again in spite of negative consequences. <laughs> as far as I can tell, the Indian parliament is addicted to this concept that creating alternative dispute resolution forms will solve the problem of delay. At a conceptual level, it is nonsensical to think that that's what's going to happen. Why is that? All of these non-court di dispute resolution forms are designed to be allowing more access to the court systems or to dispute resolution that cannot reduce the number of cases. Increasing the number of cases can't lead to reducing them. It's a mathematical impossibility. It's a logical impossibility. It doesn't make any sense. The concern basically is that you're targeting making courts more available for poor people, you're addressing only one of the effects of the delays of the Indian court system, which is it denies access to people. By creating this, you're not going to reduce congestion. You're just opening up a cheaper forum, basically, for those people who can't use the court system at present, since we already know that the Indian litigation rate is much below that of most other countries. There's pent-up demand there, but people just can't use it. OK. So what do I think of these reforms? Um, as you might have guessed, I'm not terribly optimistic about them. <laughs> Why is that? Well, think about increasing the judiciary size. Sure, why not? Let's have more judges. I like judges. They're fun to have dinner with. They have cute quips they tell me and stuff. But the truth is, really, it's just an improvement in infrastructure. Think of courts as being like roads, right? The concern in India is that the courts in India are congested, like the roads in New York are congested. So what is the solution to this? The solution that most people adopt is, let's build more roads. Let's build more courts. OK, what usually happens when you build more roads? It works great for about two to three years until you get congestion again. Right? Why is that? Here's the usual simple reason. For example, if you build more roads in New York, people realize that now you waste less time driving because there are more roads. So a lot of the people who are taking the subway decide it makes sense to drive. And then within two to three years, they congest up the roads again. Similarly, with the court system, we already know there's a great deal of pent-up demand because India's litigation rate is actually much lower than, it's, than would be the case in most other countries. So you would expect to see a temporary reduction in the number of suits brought, or at least in the delays involved, and then back up to the same level. In fact, that is precisely what's happened every single time they've increased the number of courts in India. Two years, you see a little bit of a speed increase in getting cases resolved, and then all of a sudden, you're back to the same delays. Why is that? Because you're not solving the problem. You're just building more roads. The reason why the roads are congested is not because there are too few roads usually. There's some impact on that. The main reason is that the cost to people to do alternatives is not cheap enough. The best way, for example, to reduce the congestion on New York roads, make subways dirt cheap. That'll do it. Or, alternatively, charge massive fines for driving around midtown Manhattan, which Bloomberg was actually trying to do. OK. Um, so it's not clear to me that increasing the number of courts is going to make much difference. And just as a practical reality, I don't think you're really going to enhance, uh, you're not going to be able to increase it by the scale you need to have any significant impact at present. Current estimates suggest that the current Indian court system would take 300 years to resolve all the cases. It's a long time. OK. Well, what might work? Right? Let's not be so negative. Let's try to be positive. It's good to be positive, right? makes you happy in the daytime. So what might work? Well, the first thing I'd say is, let's target actually the bulk of cases. Right? The bulk of cases are criminal. Right? Well, let's bring targeted and fewer criminal cases. How do you induce that? Well, let's have more selectivity in prosecution. How do you induce that? Assess prosecutors and police on whether they actually are successful. Right? In the United States and in many other countries, the way prosecutors sort of get promoted is if they actually win. That's a good thing, right? If you pick a case where there's a clear crime and you get a conviction, that suggests that you know what you're doing. And hence, we want those kinds of people to be moved up higher in the prosecutorial hierarchy or in the judicial hierarchy. In India, they need to focus on that. They haven't done it. The second thing, and this is actually, I think, probably even more significant, the arrest power needs to be constrained. In India, it is exceptionally easy for the police to issue arrest warrants and arrest people. Right? Now, you might think, well, why are we worried about arrest? Because if a conviction rate is so low, you're not really going to get convicted. That's true, but there's a serious harassment aspect. Right? Has anyone been inside of an Indian jail? OK, I don't mean you're a criminal, but 
Have you actually ever gone and looked at it? No. There's no reason you would, right? Why would you want to go there? Right? It turns out, if you go to an Indian jail, it's not the most pleasant place in the world. Why is that? Jails are not meant to be pleasant. Right? They're meant to impose a cost on people engaging in criminal behavior. So they are, by design, unpleasant. You only get basic cable in the United States. Right? In India, you don't get basic cable, as you might imagine. All right. So there's a serious harassment effect. Why is that significant? It's not just a cost to the individual, but this motivates police to actually frivolously arrest people. Why? Because they know the conviction rate is going to be low 